Now we're talking about young adults, ages 20 to 40. Um, and so when it comes to this, it's more about identity. So let's say it's parents and they had the first child and then that child died. Do they still call themselves a parent? Are they still a mom, a dad? And so many times identity can be challenging. Let's say it's a couple and the husband died, the wife died, the partner died. Are they still a wife? Are they still a husband? Um, so that, that identity can be challenging. Uh, maybe they were a caretaker. Um, they really took care of the partner and now they don't have that role of being a caretaker anymore. And so identity can play a huge role. Also social connections can play be a big factor. So let's say it's a mom and every Thursday she went to the park and let her little one play at the park. And she began to meet other moms there, other dads there. Um, and then all of a sudden her child dies. So all those connections she made at the park began to cease. Um, there's a young lady I was working with. She had the loss of her partner. And she talked about how they used to do a lot of couples things with their friends. But when her husband died, her friends stopped inviting her. And she understood she said, I, I, I understand, you know, they might feel awkward or they may not be sure if they want, you know, me to come along. They don't want me to feel sad. So I understand. But at the same time, it feels sad. It feels lonely not being able to simply hang out with them. Um, so just be mindful of social connections and how drastic they can change. Um, there's a book by Megan Devine. It's OK that you're not OK. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. Um, she's also in our field, um, a mental health therapist. And she talked about just being in the field and then all of a sudden her husband dying. And in her book, she talks about when her husband died, she really understood grief and just how challenging and overwhelming it is to experience. And she also talked about in her book, this concept of rearranging your address book. Um, friends who have been with you for years, all of a sudden it's a challenge for them to be with you in this really dark place. And sometimes address books do get rearranged. And sometimes it is strangers that come into our life and give us the most support. Um, so it's important, again, for us just to be mindful that our clients' address books might change. Their social interactions, social connections definitely might change. And it can lead them to feeling empty um, and alone. Um, and so there are different, of course, models grief models that you can utilize. Um, there's another training that I had done um, with eCare about different models. So I definitely encourage you guys to take a look at that one um, about those models to help rebuild connections. And the next age range is middle-aged adults, ages 40 to 60 years old. And so many times guilt can be present. Um, of course, guilt can be present in any of these developmental stages, but many times it's more prevalent in ages 40 to 60 because what's happened for the past 20, 30 years People have gotten real busy with life, whether it's work, building a career, um, establishing a family, buying a house. So many things have been on their plate. So many responsibilities have been on their plate that sometimes it's hard to keep in touch with everyone. So when their friend dies or a sibling dies or a relative dies, sometimes guilt can pop up of, man, I wish I had talked to them more. I wish I had been able to spend more time with them. I wish I had gone on more trips with them. So sometimes those I wish statements can pop up or if only I can I can spend more time with them or just have another conversation with them. So sometimes guilt and um, yearning and longing can be present. Other times um, it can be related to health concerns. So someone um, has a health concern and they end up dying from that complication. Um, sometimes a remaining partner can feel guilty of, man, I should have, told them to go to the hospital sooner. I should have drove driven them to the hospital. I should have followed up with them more. Um, there's a lot of I should have type of statements. And then also in this age range, there's many times secondary losses regarding future retirement. So usually by this age, 40 to 60, people are already planning for our retirement. How, how's it going to look when we retire? Um, what are some things that we're going to do? Where are we going to live? What are we going to do with the house? Um, and then all of a sudden their partner dies. And so instead of them retiring at this particular age, they now have to add five, 10, 15 years for some people before they can actually retire. 
And so there's multiple losses that happens, not just loss of a partner, an actual um, a person, but also loss of the plans that they had created, um, loss of income as well. Um, so there's many types of losses. Thinking about a parent or parent this age, within this age range, and they have one child and then their child dies. So not only do they experience the loss of their child, they also experience an abstract loss, which is the possibility of having a grandchild. So their name continuing on, their legacy continuing on. I'm sure they can kind of somewhat adopt another little one and say, okay, this is your my um, played grandchild, or this is someone who I'm going to treat as my grandchild. But it's not always the same as having a biological grandchild who carries on your last name um, and leaves the legacy. And so that can be very challenging for a lot of parents to not be able to be a grandparent and know what that's like. And so next, we're going to talk about older adults. Um, this is not um, something that I created. Um, this is, yeah, I'm, I did not create this age range, just to let you know. Uh, but by this age, individuals have experienced multiple losses, whether it is a loss of a death or a loss of a job, um, loss of health, loss of independence because loss of health. Um, social roles can change. Um, so, for example, moving into a nursing home. Um, so when we move into a nursing home, there's a loss of freedom, loss of independence, um, loss of familiar surroundings as well. There's a lot of strange noises that can happen. A lot of um, people who they don't know. Um, and there's, so there's many loss, different types of losses that can be present. Um, and so when it comes to loss of dependence, um, loss of a partner, um, or, um, like I had mentioned, um, health can be um, a major one. So then now they have to depend on others. Um, moving into their children's home um, is something that's happening quite often. And so when it comes to the developmental grief responses, you can hear that there are a lot of different types of losses that can happen. It's not just the actual loss itself, but there's other losses, secondary losses, what they're called. So we have the primary loss, which is that initial loss, such as the death of a partner. And then we have secondary losses. So in other words, other voids that are left. So now instead of the person having two household income, it's now a one household income. Uh, and so it's important for us to address those secondary losses with our clients as well. And it's important for us to normalize, normalize their experience. Normalization can be something so empowering. It helps people to be able to manage their experiences a lot more because they recognize that I'm not alone. Even if we don't agree with what's going on, even if we don't agree with how they're experiencing their grief, it's still important for us to normalize that experience for them. Mm -hmm.